I think the, the first question for you uh, is what kind of a good deal or acceptable deal, what are the parameters that you can sleep at night well if we reach with the Iranian at the comprehensive deal? Um, I, I spoke about the parameters, but if you can uh, put numbers to these parameters or values to these parameters, I will appreciate it because the uh, President of the United States as well as uh, the Secretary of State have said that no deal is better than a bad deal. So what is a bad deal and what is a good deal? Jim, you want to start? I think uh, to start, you want to know where you want to end up. That's exactly the question. And so otherwise, any path is OK. Um, and I, I think you know, there are a couple of things that we want to make sure that we can accomplish, um, much of which has been discussed today. But first is, you know, is the threat of force, further sanctions, rebuilding of sanctions, the failure of an of a interim agreement or a framework or, or of a final agreement? In that case, what would we want to know? What would we want to make sure that the agreement gave us in the way of knowledge so that we could move forward? Because from when you and I, Amos, started working on this issue, what has fundamentally changed is that the Iranians now have the intellectual capital to proceed. They have the manufacturing know-how to proceed. So we are going to live with the fact that they could potentially either rebuild or continue from where they are at any time, no matter what occurs this year or next year. That, that is something we're going to have to live with and manage. And so if that's true, we would want to make sure that we have something that is very intrusive, that would help us understand intent, not, not just kind of periodically, but persistent knowledge of, of the state of their intentions. Um, we would want to understand, I think, clearly between the United States and Israel that we have the capability to at least delay, if by force or by diplomacy, preferably by diplomacy. And second, we would want to make sure that we were able to demonstrate the will to, to delay, which is, like intent, harder to measure, but is often found in the statements that we make and the agreements we make. And the agreement must make it clear that there will be a penalty, a significant penalty, for the failure to live up to whatever agreement is put together. Jim, assuming the president calling you and say, you know, I feel that somehow we lost the credibility of a military uh, attack. What could we do, not to, to attack Iran, what could we do to enhance the credibility of our determination to do it if worst come to worst? I doubt he's going to call me, but, um, but uh, you know, normally the, the activities that occur around demonstrating will have to do with exercises, with an agreement that makes it clear what the penalties are going to be, um, with red lines that don't constantly move, um, with, a, with an understanding, a deep understanding of a, what is actually occurring, or the removal. So in other words, if inspectors and, and persistent um, knowledge of what's occurring in the Iranian uh, nuclear institution is removed, then, then that is a, a, a step towards moving forward aggressively. I believe for the Iranians, one, they have to judge whether our, our capability is there, and I don't think they doubt that. They have to judge whether they believe our will is there, and we must make sure that they're not, there's no gray around that. And then number three, they have to judge whether or not they could deceive us long enough to make a difference. And, and those three problems will exist from now until any time in the future that I can imagine how to do. Let's move from a military discourse to diplomatic discourse. And who is better than the former minister of, uh, uh, of Germany to tell us, can diplomacy deliver? Can diplomacy deliver the solution? I don't know. At least uh, it should be tried. Uh, we can't know that beforehand. 
But uh, allow me, for the sake of the discussion, um, to be frank. I mean, what we see now is that a case will be built. And uh, in, a, in, a, in, in two directions. If there will be a diplomatic um, agreement, a comprehensive agreement, and the final agreement is the beginning and not the end, but if there will be a comprehensive agreement, I think the essence must be that the breakout capability of Iran will be reduced. This is very important. And not only for the sake of Israel, and not only for Western allies in the region, but there are also high stakes on the global level. Because a nuclearized Iran will not only lead to a nuclear arms race in the region, which will also change the strategic posturing of Europe and uh, other regions, but it will be also the end of the NPT. The message would be quite clear to smaller powers. Um, serenity in the 21st century will be de defined by nuclearization, military nuclearization. And I think for the United States and all of us, this is really a very important element because a world without the NPT um, will be a very different and definitely not more secure world. So therefore, I think um, the process which has started now um, is very important. And I don't know whether it's helpful to say from the very beginning, this is a bad deal. It was, a, it was for six months, the opening. It was the opening a door, whether we can walk through the door what we will find in the room, we will see. And therefore, I, I can only full-heartedly support uh, what Dennis Ross said, that let's put that on the test. Now, reduce the breakout capability will be the key issue. And um, you have to make the case if you want to increase the sanctions, because the sanctions are not built in an empty space. There are different interests, the Chinese, the Russians, the Indians. I'm not talking about middle-sized and smaller powers which can be pressured. But you can't pressure China, you can't pressure India, and definitely also not Russia. So if you want to preserve the pressure, you have to be credible with a process. And that's exactly what happened in Geneva, and therefore allow me, with all due respect, as a guest and close friend of Israel, it's not such a bad deal, allow me to say that, in defense of uh, the negotiators um, which were in Geneva. And thirdly, um, even if there will be a complete failure, which I doubt, because if you analyze the Iranian strategy, it won't be a black and white decision. They tried, I mean, to defend their interests, but avoid it always to move too close to the red line of a nuclearization program. They, they don't want to have a showdown. And knowing this, I think it can be also used. And there are interesting changes in Tehran. I've been there in December too, and there are interesting changes, um, which can be also, I think, uh, put into the calculation. But if the worst case scenario will be the outcome, what you described as military action. Then, allow me, I'm not a military man, but we should have some thoughts about uh, uh, the legitimacy of such an action. I mean, why is Iran today in this strong position? If we would have had this debate in January 2003, um, ah, I don't believe that uh, you would have invited me because I was against the war in Iraq. And why? Because I saw the vacuum coming and I saw the profiteur of the vacuum. It was Iran, only Iran. And uh, with, with their capabilities, without the support of uh, uh, the United States and those who supported the United States moving into Iraq. I think uh, the Iran would be in a very different situation nowadays and not as strong as they are. So we should think about um, the legitimacy of a possible action which, God may forbid, 
will not take place. And therefore, I recommend strongly to understand that a credible diplomatic process will also contribute to the worst case scenario, which will be very important. Um, therefore, <laughs> allow me to say, I think uh, it's the need for a hopefully successful diplomatic process, but a credible diplomatic process is unavoidable if we are thinking that Iran is moving in a direction, and I have no doubt about that since 2003, by the way, because you are not starting with uh, enrichment, with uh, uh, the plutonium line, with warheads for uh, uh, TNT, makes definitely no sense, and it's better you burn the money, because militarily, I was told it makes no sense. So I have no doubt about the intentions, but therefore I think the strategy which is now, which has now started, uh, is the right one in these two directions. It's diplomatic success, I pray for that, or increased sanctions, or God forbid, a military uh, consequence. Yeah, but looking backward, as I say, it's the privilege of the historians. We are policy guys, and we want to look uh, into the future. And once again, what is your definition for a successful deal uh, with Iran? I will let you time to think and move to, uh, to Jane. And what is your definition? Well, let me make a few points and answer okay. that. First of all, I think our motto needs to be, to paraphrase from Ronald Reagan, mistrust and verify. And um, Haas has basically said the, the, the same thing. Uh, that's my first point. Uh, my second point is that, um, like Yoshka, I think the deal that was struck was certainly not perfect, but it was not terrible. It was uh, a way to start a serious negotiation to a final outcome which will be very tough to achieve. And my definition of success of the final outcome is one where uh, Ar Iran must seriously degrade its uh, number of centrifuges, the enriched fuel that it has. Um, it must uh, take apart the heavy water reactor. It must address uh, some of its delivery capacity, its missiles, and it must Im impress uh, the world with, with a, 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 a vow to stop terror activities through Hezbollah and to become a good citizen. I mean, that's a lot to require Iran to do. Uh, whether that's achievable, I don't know. The president said it's a less, our president said it's a less than 50% chance. But I think we have now got um, people, the right people in the room to discuss this possibility. I just want to make a couple of more points. Uh, I don't know, uh, and, and this builds on what Yoshka said, I don't know that the P5 plus one will stay together if a good faith effort is not made to negotiate. That's a lot of negatives. I think it will not stay together if this uh, effort is not made. And that's very important because the sanctions were so effective because they were international sanctions, not unilateral sanctions. So that's one point. And the second point is, if the, uh, the military option, which I think will be justified if everything else fails, is to be used, it's very important to have, as lawyers say, and I'm a lawyer, uh, exhausted all remedies. And I just want to close with, with um, the, the two sentences uh, in Obama's speech from last night, which I thought could not have been clearer. Uh, he said, and I actually stayed up most of the night to listen to this, so I want you to know, um, I, I, I want you to feel sorry for me. Uh, he said, if Iran's leaders do not seize th this opportunity, then I will be the first to call for more sanctions and stand ready to exercise all options to make sure Iran does not build a nuclear weapon. Dave Petraeus said yesterday that he believes that Obama's prepared to use the military option, and I, be I believe that he's prepared to use it uh, if the other options fail. Yoshka? 
Well, I, as I said before, I think uh, uh, both lines must be addressed, uh, the uranium line and uh, um, means enrichment. Um, there must be reductions. Uh, there must be also agreed limits, uh, uh, intrusive inspections, verifications, uh, um, uh, and the plutonium line. I think uh, Iraq as a, a heavy water reactor um, uh, will create an increase in the breakout capability, a substantial increase and not a decrease. So uh, these will be uh, the major issues where I, I would be careful um, to combine the uh, nuclear talks with very important uh, uh, issues, uh, whether it's uh, hegemonial aspirations, uh, support of uh, Hezbollah or human rights issues, because then uh, there is a risk that you will trap yourself. Uh, from that point of view, uh, I think uh, um, there is an opportunity. I wouldn't be too pessimistic. Uh, uh, whether it's 50% or less than 50%, I don't know, but there is definitely an opportunity because the debate in Iran is between one side who thinks more in the direction of defending the revolution and going the North Korean path. It means isolation, which from my point of view is not a serious option for Iran um, and um, will create uh, very serious problems for them. The majority, including the supreme leader, and I believe also including uh, the generals of the Republican Guard, um, is on the track, let's try whether we can reach an agreement. Will they give up their strategic intentions? No, I doubt that. Is that uh, really, I mean, uh, um, a block? Uh, or will this really block um, uh, the efforts of the West led by the United States? No. Because this is then a process of transformation. And I was... Um, actually in a hospital in the morning when the news came uh, about the agreement in Geneva. And uh, there were all the nurses and uh, doctors were around me and uh, were asking me um, in English, um, what does that mean? There was a huge excitement and one, one uh, uh, doctor said, this means peace with America. So this was a public perception. And there was a huge incitement. I wouldn't underestimate the kind of process. We should stick to our mistrust. And verification is key. As you said, I never thought that I would quote Ronald Reagan one day, but you see, I'm getting out. I'm getting out. And uh, so, but actually, that's exactly what we should do. And I think Israel can play there a very important role. Allow me again, as a, as a really close friend, um, to ask the question whether it was really in the interest of the state of Israel um, to go publicly in this counterposition. I know that your institute had a different uh, approach. I read it in the internet. Yes, but, huge but. And I think this would have been a wiser and uh, I think also more self-serving based on the Israeli interest um, uh, position. So it's also an opportunity for Israel uh, to contribute uh, to the negotiations about a comprehensive settlement and this should be used and not going into the public confrontation. Yeah, let's move to the issue of sanctions. I would like very much to hear your assessment of whether the sanctions regime is still there or it is dismantling as we speak? Anyone? Yeah. The plane was full of businessmen when I flew to Tehran. Did they come back with contracts? I seriously doubt. Is there an approach uh, to uh, violate uh, the sanctions regime? I mean, uh, uh, national or, uh, or um, uh, uh, international? I seriously doubt, because the sanctioned regime, and especially the leverage of the United States and the EU, is pretty, pretty good. Um, so, um, yes, 
they want to make business. There's a great business opportunity. On the other side, there is also a huge, huge uh, uh, stick uh, which is still there and will continue to be there. So from that point of view, um, my information is that uh, yes, uh, uh, the business community would be happy, but they won't violate the sanctions. A different issue is Russia. This is a political issue. And uh, I think the United States, uh, which have privileged relations uh, with Russia uh, and the Europeans, but mostly the US, have to deal with that on the highest level because this is not a business issue. This is really a highly political issue. Yeah, on sanctions, it looked like the Europeans were the lead, on the lead in 2012, and then the Congress. And only in number three, the, the administration came. Where are we standing today? I, I think uh, the, the preliminary deal, the interim agreement, um, uh, commits to uh, lifting about $7 billion of sanctions. And the estimate of the impact of sanctions on Iran per year is from 60 billion to about 95 billion. So most of them remain in place, and I think they will remain in place for six months. There are press reports, I'm looking at one, uh, that says at Davos, Iran tries to reopen the bazaar, and it mentions that Rouhani met last Thursday with uh, 35 business people um, talking about automobiles, metals, and the oil sector in Iran. And there are people who want to do deals with Iran, including Americans, who at the moment are, are, are definitely holding back. I think the reach of our Treasury Department is great, and they would be foolish to do it. Um, but I think the sanctions will hold, uh, certainly through the negotiations, and if the negotiations yield success, we've defined that, that would be a huge victory. If they don't, uh, for sure, the United States Congress will require the president, whether he vetoes the bill or not, to increase the sanctions. My hope is that uh, the bill that is pending in our Congress will continue to get co-sponsors, people who agree to vote for it, but there will be no action to pass the bill until after the six-month time clock uh, is over. Uh, I think it would be a mistake to pass it now. It would be an easy out for Iran. Uh, and. Um, Negotiation is the better course. I think it is a much wiser course. It will yield a better result than would nuclear action, uh, military action. I'm not against military action, but military action delays the clock. A negotiation hopefully uh, ends the clock and comes up with Iran back in the community of nations and opens the possibility for a deal on, uh, I think, on Syria and other better behavior by Iran. Um, just one more point, and that is Iran wants this deal, or certainly Rouhani wants this deal. Um, they want out from the draconian sanctions that we have successfully imposed. And that is leverage that we have if we use it correctly and if we negotiate well. I know a lot of people are afraid that the U.S. negotiators will be too weak and will give up too much. But with the pressure of, of Israel, with the pressure of the United States Congress, and with the world looking on, I think there, I, I'm an optimist. Why would I have served in Congress for 17 years? Uh, I think there's a chance this can come out well. Jim, uh, both of us wrote a paper about a year ago. If wars come to wars, who should do it? Israel or America? And it's came, it's came balanced. Some advantages for America to do it, some advantages for Israel. I want to ask you what I asked uh, General Petras yesterday. Is America still considering doing something? Is America capable of doing something? Because uh, I read two letters of the uh, chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff to a member of Congress and to a very respected senator about Syria, explaining how difficult it is for the U.S. military to operate in Syria, where, as we spoke before, uh, 100,000 people are killed. And it's, I wonder if Syria is such a big problem, uh, is America capable of doing something in Iran? 
and is the taxpayers $600 billion is not, should not serve you as a, a strategic tool? Nothing like baiting the question here. <laughs> uh, you know, I must say that hasn't changed. The capability is certainly there. Um, you know, I, you have to eat the microphone. In in our closer. Okay. You know, in our uh, paper that we did together, um, the capability of the United States, in in all deference to the um, Israeli military, is probably more capable in in many areas than the Israeli uh, military options. It doesn't mean, one, that they're tied together. Israel, Israel may decide to act in its own interests and, and certainly always reserves that right. And the United States may do the same and, and reserves that right. Um, it would be better for us to be coherent and tied together and have the same basis, in fact, for why we would take such an action. But the capability most certainly is there in the United States military. The papers uh, from uh, General Dempsey were about something completely different um, and, and talking much more about what it would take to be in a hostile area, protect people and uh, supply lines going in and out without entering into the conflict and how dangerous that would be. This is a very different activity and we have the full range from raids and, and uh, short strikes to full occupation. Now what the United States must consider is is, is its will to continue all the way to something like a full occupation, which I think is, is, is a difficult sell in the United States today. But there are several capabilities that are more than adequate to delay the Israeli, or I'm sorry, the Iranian capability um, for, for up to years. And, and that's probably more realistic about what will happen early. I don't know what what's on the president's mind, but he has a full range of choices. He has both the capability and the will. Can uh, you advise Israel what Israel should do in the next six months? Not militarily. I think that's a better question for you. No, it's this, for the three of you. It's for the three of you. <laughs> uh, my sense, and I think the dialogue here has been, been spot on, is that we must support the, the, uh, the dialogue, the framework, um, any type of agreement, the, the march to that, the process by which we will do that. We have to support that process. We have to hold the coalition together. I believe sanctions are far more effective than we ever thought they were going to be, number one. Number two, while I don't agree and hope that the Congress doesn't jump out ahead of the President right now, the fact that there are more sanctions to be rolled out has got to play in the calculus for Iran. For Israel, understanding that and allowing them to play out, understanding that it must think in its own terms about its own sovereignty and security, but to give this a chance to the, most, to the maximum extent possible, I think is absolutely essential. But I would add, Israel should keep the pressure on. It's helpful. Keep the pressure on the negotiators to come up with a good deal. And obviously, the threat of an Israeli strike is um, certainly seen as credible. Uh, and the U.S. sanctions legislation, the new legislation, would oblige the United States to support an Israeli strike if it's made. But I, I, I think let the six-month clock run, keep the pressure on, and then see what options are required at, at the end of that. Wouldn't it be nice if we can all celebrate at the end of six months? Unlikely, but wouldn't it be nice? Well, from my point of view, it's very easy. Uh, you should do what uh, uh, my two counterparts uh, just explained. And for the INSS, I think there is a, an additional wish, not an advice. Maybe you should start uh, some regional, but also uh, centered on the nuclear issue, combined with the uh, region and the role of Iran, um, how you see it with your crystal clear realism, to develop some out of the box scenarios or option, some fresh ideas. I think this would be extremely helpful and you have the capabilities to do that. That's exactly what we are doing in the last two years. You know, when I came on board, uh, 
the first year after I retired, I said nothing about Iran. I thought that I have to cool myself, and I, everything I knew was uh, highly confidential. But in this one year of my uh, personal uh, cooling, the Israeli public was exposed to the uh, discussion by two figures with a lot of authority on defense. On one hand, uh, ex uh, f a former uh, head of Mossad, General Dagan, and on the other hand, uh, General Minister, Prime Minister Barak. And Dagan said that attacking Iran is the stupidest idea I ever heard. And Barak have said we should have done it yesterday. So we came to this vacuum and create a framework how to think about such a crucial and important strategic issue uh, for Israel. And we will continue to do it. And thank you. We can ever, we always can do it better. So thank you for your advice. I want to take uh, uh, two minutes to explain the difference between uh, Israel and the United States. Because on one hand, we are on the same data. Uh, we share the intelligence, we speak a lot, uh, and unlike 2007, when America published an NIE that doubt the fact that Iran is developing nuclear weapons, uh, in 2008, 9, 11, and of course 14, we are on the same data. And we even taking this, the same conclusions from the data, because sometimes you have data with different conclusions. So the basic, the foundations are the same. The goal is the same, the strategic goal. President Obama has said Iran will not have a nuclear weapons. This is the goal of the Prime Minister, no doubt about it. So why in this home, in this house with the same foundation and the same roof, the doors and the windows are totally different. So let me give you four reasons. Four, and to remember it, take four T's. Okay? The first is threat perception. Uh, America have lived with 3,000 uh, Soviet Union missiles aimed at New York, Washington, Chicago. You still have China, Pakistan, North Korea. Uh, and you look at it as a, a, to Iran as additional small threat. For us, it's a huge threat because uh, it's a country that called to the destruction of Israel, wipe it off the map, and they are developing the instrument that, to be able to do it. So different threat per perception. Second, different trauma. Our trauma is uh, always set forward by the Prime Minister. It's the Holocaust. History has its sense of humor. We are six million Jews here. And uh, Hitler was not taken seriously when he said that he wanted to destroy Israel. The rest of the world did some diplomatic moves. And the analogy, uh, the Prime Minister can make it better than me because he believes in it and I don't. Because I think that the, the, the Holocaust is, is a very important uh, remembrance for us, but it cannot be a policy-guided issue. We, are, we created this country uh, to be stronger and to take care of ourselves, and not to be uh, any more depend on the war. But it's a different trauma. Your trauma, you know better than me. It's called Afghanistan and Iraq, two wars, Boots on the ground, a trillion dollar, thousands of people killed, and not achieving your strategic goals. That's, that's the main issue. And losing the moral authority of America as the leader of the war. It's a huge trauma, and I understand it. So that's why it is looked differently from Israel and from America. Third is the trigger, and people are not paying attention to the trigger. The Israeli trigger is not to let Iran the capability to break out. This is what the Prime Minister have said. Unfortunately, the President have said it only once in the third presidential debate, but he never repeated it before or after. Because your real trigger is Iran 
breaking out for the bomb. They are uh, enriching above 20% to military grade and weaponizing. And the Israelis are asking, are you, will you be able to detect it? How short it will be that you will make your decision? Is the president will go to Congress and Congress will not agree and the New York Times will write against it? And are you going to do it on the last minute? So it's a different trigger. And final is a different time, timing. The Israeli timing is not unlimited. We have our capabilities, but uh, Prime Minister Barak, uh, Defense Minister Barak used to call it zone of immunity. I never agreed with him, even though I invented the term. <laughs> but I, I didn't put it to a certain uh, date. But uh, uh, the Americans' capabilities are much higher. So you have more time. At the end of the, I have to uh, end up with another T. And this is trust. We do need to bridge these differences if we will have the trust that we are really uh, on the same goal and America will not let Iran be nuclear. So this is, uh, before we close, uh, I will give each one of you an opportunity to, uh, to say something that he still wants to say. Jane. I said this morning, almost that I would fly around the world to be at a conference with you. I think you are enormously insightful, and uh, this uh, panel is no exception. Um, we have to trust each other, and we have to mistrust Iran. That's why she was a member of Congress. <laughs> Nine terms. I think there are two things that uh, were touched on briefly but are, are not emphasized enough. The first is the nexus of terrorism in Iran um, in the calculus. It is so critical, certainly, for our country. Um, that, that's one. And the second is a military strike is not a solution. Um, we have already passed the point where we're having to learn to live with a potentially nuclear Iran for the rest of time. And even if we do a strike, it does not eliminate the potential for Iran to do it. It delays it. It may dissuade Iran from going further, but we will have to live with the potential for Iran to make a decision to go nuclear forever. So there's not just one more step after a bad agreement. There's not just one more step after a good agreement. This is something that we have to live with, and we have to be sure this process has the enduring capability to understand the fact that, as people, we're going to have to live with this for many, many years. Well, with the four T's, um, I share the threat perception and analysis. I would even go further with the international dimension of the collapse of the NPT Treaty, which would really, in a very negative, substantial way, change the world. And I think this is an important element for the US um, as the only superpower, because the same instincts uh, where not only the US but also the Western Europeans are used to the threat of uh, nuclear warheads um, made also quite clear that the NPT was a, a dramatic positive change uh, to contain um, the proliferation risk and uh, linked to terrorism, I think it would be a real nightmare. So, number one, I agree. I fully understand um, the trauma. I mean that in a very honest and serious way. And um, maybe you won't believe it, I spoke in Tehran about that in front of students. Because I was asked about Israel and when the West will give up the support of Israel. And I said, forget it. If you think that, uh, forget it. And I also explained, because there was a debate about uh, um, the nuclear armament of Israel, whether it's real or not, uh, we don't know. That's the official meaning. But 
And I tried to explain what it means to survive, as a German I did that, what it means for a people to survive um, an attempted uh, genocide, the Holocaust. And I said, the second time I experienced that after Israel was with the Muslim people in Bosnia. The same spirit. And the third time I experienced that with the Christian people in Armenia. In all these three places, Israel, um, Bosnia, with the Bosnian Muslims, and Armenia, you can sense the same determination that this will never happen again. And every leader who is not strong enough to avoid such a second attempt will be condemned, not only by history, but cursed by his own people. I understand that fully, and I, I think this is very important to understand your position. Third, the trigger. This is a question of negotiation, and there I think um, uh, trust must be built between the parties. And therefore I say, as I did it before, it's not helpful to have a public confrontation, but trust must be built by cooperation in the preparation of this process. And thirdly, uh, the timing. I think uh, uh, the U.S. is a credible partner. If the U.S. wouldn't be any longer a credible partner, this region wouldn't be in the center. Japan depends in an environment which is much more dangerous and closer to 1914, the outbreak of the First World War, on the credibility of the U.S. Uh, on the credibility of the U.S., the nuclear guarantee the U.S. Uh, has given to Japan and some other uh, East Asian countries, this shouldn't be forgotten. So if there is a need for trust building, it should be used now within the next months and uh, to have, I would say, a show of unity and strength to the other side. This would be extremely helpful for the process. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful panel. And there is the tale on the lawyer, the old lawyer, that his son, uh, graduating from Harvard Law School, came the first day to work. He went to, uh, uh, on to a client and he came back very proud that he solved the problem. And the father told him, how we will make money? What have you done? I hope that next year the Iranian problem will be solved even if we don't have uh, the file to do uh, living off. Thank you very much.